So I'll, I'll start with a quote. It has been presented as a reality, and it emerges as a curious ghost story, a strange revelation of stranger beliefs, of still stranger customs. Told as bluntly as it has been, it strikes of stupidity, silly superstition, outmoded religion. Yet, for all that, it is an interesting record, else we shouldn't have taken so long to dismiss it, and incredible in its way as a documentary film of life among the pygmies or a trip to the Middle Ages. It is that odd. <laughs> Strange, incredible, odd. These were the impressions of Frank Nugent, film critic from, for the New York Times, upon viewing the, the Yiddish film Der Dibek, The Dibek shot in Poland in summer 1937 and released in the, in the US a few months thereafter. Nugent's reproval is rooted in a sense of otherness the film may evoke, a curiosity accompanied by a certain distaste, and in his case, even disgust. These odd feelings, we learn, have less to do with a few, and I quote, childishly crude attempts at fantasy, and more with a peculiar dark environment depicted in what the viewer described as a basically realistic film. The Hasidic Kabbalistic milieu, or habitat, presented on screen strikes Nugent as foreign, like life in the Middle Ages or among the pygmies. In other words, as exceeding the boundaries of the civilized, perhaps even the human. Anti-Semitic bias, no doubt. Yet Nugent's review relates also to a salient streak of the cinematic divok, namely its exotization of Eastern European Jewish life. Indeed, not only the New York Times journalist, but also the reviewer for the New York Yiddish newspaper Vorwärts, Yiddish for Forward, associated the film and the play on which it is based with notions such as archaic, dark, and remote. And I'll quote. Uh, uh, it is noteworthy that such a play as the Dybbuk, which was so far removed from life and the relation to things in the years after the World War, precisely such a play has captivated everyone. The drama has so much depth, beauty, and poetry that it is sure to captivate even people who haven't the slightest idea about the archaic and dark shtetl life of the Polish and Russian Hasidic Jews presented in the play. How is it that both the New York savvy Nugent and the Shtetlborn Kissin ascribe dark or medieval qualities to the Dibok? Why did the cinematic Dibok evoke such strong feelings of otherness for viewers as diverse as the xenophobic American journalist and the Eastern European Jewish immigrant? In today's lecture, I'll try to answer these questions and examine the mechanisms by which the film manages to convey an exotic flair alongside a sense of quote-unquote authenticity. Folk performance plays a key role in this exotization process, as we'll see in film clips from the memorable wedding scene, arguably the film's highlight, which masterfully combines traditional Jewish wedding dances with expressionist choreography, rococo dresses with grotesque beggars, and a macabre Jewish badchen, master of ceremonies and jester, with ghostly possession. Um, it all starts, as Kissin reminds us, with the original play, written by Ansky, or in his original name, Shloime Zeinville Rappaport, and marked by a notable folklor uh, folkloristic emphasis. Ansky, as you may, uh, as many of you know, was a pioneer ethnographer of Jewish life in Imperial Russia, who in the years 1912 uh, to 1914 had an expedition to the small towns or shtetlach of Eastern European Jewish Pale of Settlement, the Dark Continent, to use the words of Nathaniel Deutsch. Uh, so here we can see Ansky uh, at work uh, with his informants. I think you can recognize who's Ansky and who are the informants. Uh, and actually, uh, we have many. I could have given a whole talk about just the findings. So, and you can. We also we have recordings and 
uh, many photographs. This is just uh, a few of the artifacts that uh, the expedition uh, collected and that we still um, uh, we, we still have access to. They're mostly in St. Petersburg and their various anthologies um, showing the, them. Um, devoted to the field of Jewish ethnography since 1907, Ansky approached his project with a sense of a mission. A socialist and a secular Jew, Ansky perceived folklore as the only possible basis for contemporary Jewish culture and saw himself as the redeemer of his findings. His main objective was not the preservation of materials, but rather the transformation into a work of art endowed with national meaning. He achieved the, this goal most successfully in his play Der Dibbuk, written between 1913 and 1917, featuring possession and exorcism alongside other folk elements, such as superstition, idioms, um, folk songs and folk tales, including Hasidic hagiography and parables, and the story of Kiddush Hashem, or Jewish martyrdom. The figure of a guest who appears in town, inquiring about the ancient synagogue and the local customs, may hint to the anthropological inquiry on which the play is based. Many, including the Hebrew poet Chaim Nachman Bialik and the Yiddish language critic Shmuel Nigel, criticized the Dibuk for its eclectic, musing-like quality and regarded it as a jumble of folk customs. Yet a closer look at the ethnographic display in the play show, shows that it was called and shaped according to ideological and artistic considerations. Following the example of Peretz, uh, um, in his, Yuleib Peretz in his pseudo or neo-Hasidic stories, or in dramas like By, by Nacht auf den Alten Mark, A Night in, uh, at the Old Marketplace, or The Golden Arcade, The Golden Chain, Ansky interpreted his traditional materials according to his social and aesthetic values. Owing to his socialist ethos and perhaps also to his professional pride as an ethnographer, Ansky avoids trite Yiddishkeit um, and presents almost no familiar Jewish rituals like the, the Sabbath, the Shabbat, or the Jewish holiday. Instead, he prefers the exceptional, possession, exorcism, and a rabbinic trial where the plaintiff is a dead person. Exploiting the, drama, uh, the dramatic potential of these spectacular events, Ansky also emphasizes their social rather than theological significance. Ansky, Ansky's debut takes place in the purely traditional setting of a Hasidic community and in a vaguely defined past sometime in the 19th century, featuring a world completely untouched by modernity. It narrates the story of two young lovers, the rich merchant's uh, daughter, Leia, and the poor yeshiva student, Honen, who can hardly be considered her suitable match. When Sander, Leia's rich father, decides to marry her off to a better qualified groom, the desperate Honen turns to black Kabbalistic magic, which ultimately results in his death. Refusing to forget Honen, Leia becomes possessed by him in the very midst of her wedding ceremony. The exorcism ritual that follows reveals the backdrop love story of Sander and Honen's father, Nissen, who, as young yeshiva students, have promised to marry their then unborn children to each other. Leia and Honen's love is thus a fulfillment of an ancient oath between their fathers, where Sander's refusal, whereas Sander's refusal to marry his daughter to Honen constitutes a betrayal of his departed friend. Only after a trial against Sander featuring the conjured up Nissen does the Rebbe succeed in exercising, uh, exercising Honen from Leia's body. The triumph over the persistent spirit is, however, followed by Leia's death, perceived as a reunion with her dead lover. Der Dibbuk is then, as Naomi Zeidman has argued, a story about the fraught relations between past and present. The narrative is that of the dead who return to the living, Honan who takes over Leia's body or soul, and Nissen who returned to demand his death from Sender. And the sin which motivates this tragic melodrama, as Nomi writes, is that of forgetting or rather repressing the past. 
Moreover, I would like to add, the whole community in the Divuk, ostensibly unaffected by the crisis of modern life, engages with the challenges of rupture, loss, and remembrance. Anski, the modern scholar, may have thus created traditional society in the image of his own fractured identity. The archaic, remote, and exotic quality of Anski's play has become even more prominent in Evgeny Vartangov's renowned expressionistic, symbolistic production for the Hebrew Habima Theater, which premiered in Moscow in 1922. Uh, this indeed was a landmark uh, production which ran for decades and it made uh, Hannah Rovina, whom you see here, the actress who played Leah, uh, the possessed bride, it made her remain young forever. <laughs> she kept playing it into her 50s or 60s. <laughs> um, Where, whereupon she started playing one of the uh, fathers. <laughs> that could be, yeah. Um, yet the most significant step in the exotization of the Dybbuk was, and I will, uh, as I will try to convince you now, uh, the 1937 film directed by Michał Wyszynski, at the time a highly popular Polish director, there is the one um, standing in the middle, um, so at the time a highly popular Polish director who happened also to be a Jewish convert to the Catholic faith. So uh, he was born Moshe Vax, and legend has it that he, on the set, he pretended he didn't understand Yiddish. Uh, and he actually survived the Holocaust, and this is him, him in the 50s. Uh, you recognize with whom? <laughs> with Sophia Loren. And this is from, by the way, this uh, image is from a very interesting documentary that just came out in, uh, just a year ago. It's called The Prince and the Dybbuk and uh, uh, I highly recommend it. Um, so, created to appeal to Jewish and non-Jewish audiences on both sides of the ocean, the film was, and still is, likely to strike its viewers, whether in the 1930s or in the 21st century, as bizarre or exotic. While Ansky's writing was rooted in the attempt to establish a secular Jewish identity and to create socially aware, a socially aware national drama, the cinematic de Dibbuk was first and foremost envisioned as a product for mass consumption. The 33-year-old film director Vashinsky, a wunderkind of Polish cinema, came to the film with vast experience in commercial cinema but not much interest in Jewish issues. He was, however, not alone and he cooperated with many of Polish Jewry's rising talents um, young and less young, including the Yiddish writer and photographer Alter Katzizne, playwright and theater director Mark, Mark Arenstein, also known as Andrzej Marek, composer Henrik Kohn, and choreographer Judith Berg. These aesthetically and socially committed artists aspired to create a film that would be up to the standards of Anski's legendary play and its mythological stage productions. It wasn't just um, the Habima production that was legendary. This, uh, this, is, for, uh, this is from the um, production by the Der Wilner Truppe, and it actually shared the same uh, tzaddik, the, the, the actor who, who played the uh, Rebbe, the, uh, is um, uh, Moravsky. He played uh, in both the Wilner Truppe production and in the film. Uh, so these people, no less importantly, would also hoping to present proudly and represent Jewish culture for Jews and non-Jews alike. What signal alternative for Nugent served as a source of pride, nostalgia, and or identity making for many of his contemporaries facing the pressures of growing anti-Semitism. All these various motivations behind the film, the commercial, the aesthetic, the nationalistic, were not necessarily at odds. Indeed, creating a sense of authenticity and a certain sense of digestible or approachable exoticism where it was common actually to, to these different motivations. Hardly striving for realism, the filmmakers nevertheless, nevertheless sought and found an authentic, quote unquote, location for shooting the Dybbuk 
the Eastern European Jewish tell of Kajimesh Dole, which then, like today, stands as a picturesque example of the Polish countryside. Uh, so this is contemporary, uh, which may conveniently be reach, reached as a day trip from Warsaw. Um, and here, this is from the internet. Uh, and uh, yeah, see, and uh, it's not as popular as the one going to Auschwitz or Treblinka, but it's, uh, um, or Krakow, but it's also a, an option for visitors, people who visit Warsaw. Uh, but in the 30s, it could also serve as a prototypical shtetl, uh, the small Jewish town. So these amazing photographs from the 30s, from 1931 and 32, uh, were actually taken by another Jewish convert to, uh, to the Catholic faith. Uh, his name was Benedict Jerzy Doris, and uh, he was a pioneer of Polish photography in the interwar, and we have uh, these amazing photographs of Kazimierz Dolny in the 1930s which may explain why this would be a good location to shoot a film on a Jewish title. Um, and now maybe I'll show you a film clip where you, uh, you see how they actually used um, this picturesque um, location. Um, Sorry, just a sec. Although Kajimish Dolne is very uh, attractive, surely, uh, most of the film, including uh, its most dramatic scenes, was actually shot in a studio. Constructed as an expressionistic town square featuring slanted walls and ancient gravestone, dim lights, and eerie shadows. The soundtrack, set design, and dances were clearly inspired by German expressionistic cinema and the play stage production productions, most notably Habima's grotesque adaptation. Indeed, stylization and exotization pervade every aspect of the film, from its Hasidic songs and dances to an uncanny beggar's dance and the dance macabre, uh, a, a gothic funeral procession and occult practices in the mikveh, the ritual bathhouse, and from the tragic skeptical Hasidic rebbe to the supernatural figure of the messenger. Far from shunning changes, Vashinsky and his team turned the revered play into a melodramatic Gothic musical and popularized, popularized its ethnographic disposition. The cinematic debut combined vivid, colorful ethnographic exhibits with grotesque and macabre elements, such as a cemetery, a ghost, a mysteriously moving curtain, parochet in the synagogue, and black Kabbalistic magic, thus popularizing and deepening the shadow of death present in the play and in its various theater productions. While Ansky's play highlights verbal ethnographic findings, such as stories and idioms, the film emphasizes sources such as music, dance, and costumes, turning them into a folkloristic spectacle. Many of the so-called folk songs and dances are performed in situ. The Hasidim sing, sing a nigan, 
traditional melody at their gathering. Leia and her female friends sing a ballad while embroidering. And Nutu, the coachman, sings a typical workman's song while cleaning the reins. In other cases, following the tradition of the musical film, songs of offer glimpses into the character's feelings, as in Hanan's spontaneous songs of, Song of Songs. Um, uh, sorry, not in Hanan, in uh, uh, Nissen's uh, song, song, song of Songs, Shir Hashirim. And we'll see this clip now. Ansky's play makes selective use of elements from Jewish tradition and folklore. The film presents a wide range of prayers and blessings, songs and superstitions. Unlike the play, the film features many other religious elements absent from the play at common in Yiddish cinema, such as the funeral pr procession, including the traditional Kaddish prayer, an elaborate wedding ceremony complete with a chupe, marriage canopy, bet betrothal blessings, and the ceremonial encircling of the groom. A Sabbath meal at Sanders house completely absent from the play becomes an opportunity for exhibiting Jewish customs such as a kiddish ceremonial blessing on the wine, a lavish main course, which is a whole carp, Sabbath candles displayed by a prolonged close-up, massive tome of the Tenerene, uh, which is a book of paraphrased biblical passages directed at women. So Tzenerene, uh, uh, from which Aunt Frade recites, uh, etc. Another scene uh, depicting the Jewish holiday of Hoshana Rabo, um, Hoshana Rabo, provides a picturesque display of men wrapped in prayer shawls and carrying the four species. Uh, these are plants endowed with symbolic significance uh, during the holiday of Sukkot. You see why this talk is appropriate <laughs> now. Uh, and they who encircle the synagogue's main space accompanied in voice only by Gerson, uh, Gerson Sirota, one of the best known cantors of the interwar period and probably the first cantor to have ha ever had his songs recorded. Uh, so... Um, You can see why the film is over two hours long. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you may find it just maybe not exotic and odd as I'm arguing, but just boring some people because we're not used to, <laughs> no, I mean, at least in some parts because we're not used to all, but to all this, and this may be a, a significant difference between contemporary viewers and viewers from the 30s who actually paid to hear Gershon Sirota or to see some, uh, uh, Lulavim or some uh, candles on the screen or see a, a whole singing of the um, 
song of is Shira uh, Shirim and uh, and so yeah. Okay. Uh, so. Orchestrating Jewish folklore and ritual, music and dance, the film targeted audiences accustomed to the norms of the popular Yiddish stage, which was typically infused with singing, dancing, and other vaudeville-like numbers, including passages of contorial singing. At the same time, the strong presence of nonverbal arts and the picturesque display of exotic customs and rituals helped attract audiences who couldn't understand the Yiddish spoken in the film or didn't know what these the uh, love we're all about. Uh, Ansky, who sought to establish folklore as the basis of a secular Jewish identity, would have most likely rejected this popularized spectacle of Yiddishkeit for both aesthetic and ideological reasons. However, for the creators of Yiddish film and its spectators, such displays were regular components of the cinematic commodity. Paradoxically, it is precisely because many spectators in Poland and in the United States felt estranged from the religious way of life that they enjoyed viewing Jewish tradition on screen, evoking nostalgia or relieving feelings of guilt. While Ansky stresses in his work the rupture in Jewish institutional life, presenting at Sadiq and Galtin self-doubt, a wedding ceremony interrupted twice, and an ex ex exorcism ritual that leads to the death of the possessed, the film portrays Jewish tradition in a more harmonious and congenial way, packaging Yiddishkeit as an attraction, exotic and or Hamish, intended, intended for mass consumption. And now in uh, the last part of the talk, we'll go into details and uh, take a closer look at some examples, specifically the wedding scene and, this, uh, and especially the role of the badchan. Uh, again, it's the master of ceremonies and uh, jester in the traditional Jewish wedding. Um, okay, so the film stylized wedding scene Offering a lavish ethnographic display exemplifies the film's unique amalgam of commodified Yiddishkeit, multi-layered aesthetization inspired by German expressionist cinema and by the play's stage productions and exotization processes operating in the film. Interestingly, the elaborate scene, no doubt one of the movie's highlights, is almost absent from the play. None of the many traditional wedding customs and rituals spectacularly exhibited in the film is in the play. But it is in the film, we're gonna watch it now. Uh, okay. Uh, no, I'll skip this one. So this is the Badchan. It's not as cheerful as the name Badchan Jester made. Es wird nicht helfen, kein Pfilis in ich, kein Gewein. Als uns leib, mir soll viel mehr vergehen. In Haus, die dein Freit, was die euch wenden in dich. Das Leben für ein Mensch ist sie ja teuten Tanz gegelichen. Thank you. 
Uh, so this scene you could see actually um, uh, a very famous scene it's not even uh, you could see how it's divided the part of the Badkhan is more, re more or less realistic it could be included you, they used to have speeches uh, the Badkhan used to talk about death and uh, um, fateful events and especially if one of the parents of the, the, of the bride or the groom was dead then it would be appropriate to evoke death uh, and the first part of the wedding was typically sad. He became a jester, actually making people laugh. In the second half, the first half, his job was to make the women cry. Uh, and then the second part, you see, they're not even trying to be anything near uh, realis realism or ethnography. Uh, the music is not what is not diegetic. It means that it's not the music the people hear. It's not a plasma music you'd expect. It has something that serves a the atmosphere of the film, and the, the, the woman who dances uh, the role of death here, uh, her name is uh, Judith Judith Baird, and she actually studied uh, dance uh, with Marie Wigman, who was one of the uh, pioneers of uh, expressionist new dance, modern dance, uh, Ausdruck Tanz. Uh, and she had a school in Dresden, and Marie Wigman and, and Judith, Be Judith Berg uh, studied with her. And she was very interested in uh, Marie Wigman, that is, was interested in, in using exotic elements from African uh, cultures or other non European cultures. And so when um, Judith Bell came back to Poland, she uh, used these ideas and started exoticizing the Hasidim uh, rather than the Africans, which Marie Wigman favored. Uh, so that's uh, her choreography, and also speaking about authenticity, you could see the beggars dancing there. Uh, so maybe you need to. We, we won't have time, but you actually may want to watch this clip or the film again, and because some and, and tell if, and see if you can tell which of the beggars, because they were using extras for the f wedding scene. They actually um, this will come back, right? <laughs> um, so they were actually, uh, yeah, it's okay. Um, the, the story is that they, uh, they recruited many extras with, and beggars uh, from the town, from Kojim Redondo. They were not hard to find. Uh, <laughs> so some of the beggars you see are um, uh, authentic beggars, <laughs> <laughs> uh, while others are from um, Judith, Judith Berg's uh, company. So, uh, and it's interesting to try to see who's who. Um, Anyway, um, so um, having little to do with the play, the extravagant wedding scene fits well the norms of Yiddish cinema where almost every film featured a marriage celebration. More specifically, the cinematic the Dibuk seems to draw on the folkloristic spectacle presented in uh, Josef Green's uh, Yiddel Mitten Fiddle. Um, Maybe you're familiar, it's a film that was also shot in Kajimish Dolna just a few months earlier, and it was actually uh, the most successful uh, Yiddish um, film. It was screened in Poland in September 1936, only nine months before the filming of the Dibuk began. Wedding dances, klezma, sumptuous refreshments, a badchan, the matrimonial ceremony itself, all these elements were included in Table's wedding in the internationally celebrated Yiddel Mitten Fiddle and reappear in Leia's forced marriage in the Dibbuk. Uh, both films rely on the discrepancy between the merry celebration and the bride's misery to create the dramatic tension. Exploiting the tearful part of the Jewish we wedding, which traditionally expressed sorrow, the sorrow of the young bride who is about to leave her parents' house, and especially the Badchan speech encouraging the bride to weep, both films stress the potential misery caused, caused by forced marriage. Of course, it's in a very different at atmosphere and because the Yidden Fiddle is much more jolly and it's a comedy, but it's, I think, I do believe that um, it, this film inspired um, the Dybbuk. Indeed, in, regard, uh, in this regard, the somber the Dybbuk goes farther than the light-hearted Yidl Mitten Fiddle, allowing the Badchan's gloomy performance and the woeful klezmer tunes to dominate the whole event. And we'll have another film clip, which will be as, again, it will go back and forth between two elements, 
Um, so one is the the more uh, folkloristic uh, display, and and it, and then through cross cut cutting, we go between this and the more um, uh, um, I don't know exotic gothic parts. So you'll see that now. Anyway. completely absent from Ansky's play, is set, as you've seen actually more in the previous clip, on a balcony overlooking the town squares, and uh, he serves as an imposing stage. This balcony st serves as an imposing stage for the performer, positioned high above his audience. The Bedchan's shadow cast on the wall behind him contributes to the sinister atmosphere and supplements his grave, moralistic sermon that dwells on how death awaits us all. It thus leads us smoothly to the highly charged dan dance macabre, uh, which we saw before. Um, the the Badhan's stylist performance thus amplifies the film's dark character, highlights the dramatic relationship of the living and the dead that lie th at the center of this play. Relying on the Badhan's traditional role as a master of ceremonies, the film em employs his performance to stitch together the various elements of the elaborate wedding scene presented in a series of relatively rapid intercuts, the dancers, the woeful bride, immersed in longing for her dead beloved, and the mysterious messenger whose very appearance signifies doom. In the film, the, the Badhan gives four different recitals, uh, of which we've seen so far um, one. Only the last of the Badhan's four recitals in the film can be found in the play, yet it is delivered there in another context and by another character. Frade by, um, it is said by Frade, Leia's aunt. And this is the one we're going to watch now. Bei dir steht der Wacht, für sechzig Gebäure. Sechzig Gebäure mit dem bloßen Tegens, sie wollen dich schützen, für ein abweisbar gegen ihn. Wald wird mit dir Kind meins, zu der Rippe finden, in einer Gitterschuh, in einer Maseldicker Schuh, Dein Mama, du zitkunnig ist, sie geht von ganz Eden nach Reus 
Euch in der Nähe Reus, in Gold und in Silber Reus geht's hier. Gehen ihr zweimal durch im Lechand gegen Reus, euch Hand gegen Reus. Sei nehmen sie und fahr die Hand, eine rechts, eine links. Euch kann alle die Mein, kann alle die Fein. Von uns hast du sich Reus geziert, in Gold und in Silber Schein. Entertainment, Entertainer, <Sie> Im Telejuan über Mittag reußen Becher in Hand, in Macht aber über den ganzen Land. Oh mein, wei, oh mein. Okay, so in, uh, in Anski's uh, in Anski's play, the speech dedicated to Leia's dead mother appears at the very end of the drama following the exorcism scene and preceding Leia's final reunion with Hanan through death. While there's no direct mention of a badchan in the play, Frade clearly takes on herself the role of the traditional performer, who, whenever marrying an orphan, customarily portrayed the dead parent's reaction in the world of the dead. The stage directions emphasizing the rhyme form of the speech, it says in a skandirakin dikan gesang, in the scanned rhymes, and the opening formula, bald vetmen dich fieren zu der Gruppe in a guter show, in a mazel dicker show, so when now uh, the bride is being led to the Chuppe, to the marriage canopy, clarified that this speech owes much to the tradition of the badchen. This indeed is a striking example of how Anski transforms the traditional sources, endowing them with alternative, even subversive meaning. Against the oppressive authority of men, including Leia's father Sander, who forces his daughter to, into marriage, the tzaddik and his fellows, fellow rabbis who join forces to perform the exorcism ritual, Anski constructed a female counterbonding, tying together Leia, her aunt Frade, and Leia's dead mother, and father's sister, Chane, whose name echoes that of the betrayed Chonen. Allowing the Badchan to speak through Frade, the Russified Yiddish writer and ethnographer aestheticizes and reinterprets re the traditional sources, rendering feminine that is personal, emotional, and potentially also challenging male hegemony. Interestingly, in his author authoritative Hebrew translation of Anski's play, Bialik chose to change the stage directions for Frade's speech from in scanned rhymes to in a lullaby tune. He thus merged this speech with another rhyme text that appears shortly prior to that, in which Frade tries to calm down her niece while caressing her. This erasure has possibly to do with the Hebrew national poet's aversion to the badchan associated with crude rhymes and with the oppressive norms of arranged or forced marriage. Resisting Bad Bialik's erasure of the Badchan, the film enhances the role of full performer, who now performs the words engaging with the dead mother as part of his speech in Leia's official forced marriage. Yet, in materializing Anski's subtle, uh, subtle reference to Badchan's speech, the cinematic debut ob ob obliterates Anski's idea of a feminine alternative bonding and presents a more unidimensional traditional world. Um, okay, so uh, just as a final word, um, I always, when I show the Divock or talk about the 
dip back to people, it's uh, I find that the post Holocaust perspective is usually very dominant, and it makes people uh, people are so excited to see to see this relic or a genuine documentation of Eastern Jewish life. This film was shot so shortly before uh, the Holocaust took place, and before this whole culture was um, brutally uh, destroyed and murdered, and um, and. It also very well fits into the films uh, anyway, macabre and dark nature. Uh, but what I, what I was hoping to do in tonight's talk is to show you the mal many layers of stylization, exotization, uh, distancing from the Eastern European life that were already uh, active when uh, the film was uh, made ba back in the 30s. Uh, and so this is my last word to you, that we should be aware uh, of these, we should uh, be aware of these historical dimension uh, of the film, and we, and this, and in this way we may rescue the film from collapsing into one flat image of a world on the brink of annihilation. Thank you very much. <laughs>